<laughs> Welcome to the Black Rifle Coffee Podcast. Today we've got Jericho joining us, Jenna. Patrick Montgomery is the guest, and he owns Casey Cattle Company. Welcome, Patrick. How are you, man? Good. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, fuck yeah. Um, how do you take your coffee? Black. Always? Yes. Nothing in it? Nope. Good. Like a man. Yeah. <laughs> like a man. You ever do cold coffee in the summertime? I don't do cold brew. I just don't like the taste, so it's always hot in the summer. You know what's in here? What? Cat Kent, Joe Kent's sister. Shout out. Name drop. <laughs> She takes cold brew, because I always drink cold brew. It's easy. I don't have to fuck with anybody. I just pour it, and then I get out from behind the bar thing. I drink too much of it. I sweat a lot. She steams it, and it froths up, so it, it tastes like a nitro. She was telling me about this while I was waiting out there. That's yummy. Yeah. I like real. how these two that are like, I only drink my coffee black. Then they talk about this fucking bougie ass way to have to fucking <laughs> steam their goddamn cold brew. I just learned today. Yeah, I'm not no, I'm not no pussy that has steam. anything but <laughs> black cut but but I like to take a steamer. Listen, uh, listen, I like it a little froth it. I don't like it too hot. It offends my palate. <laughs> Cold brew gives me anxiety. There's just too much fucking caffeine in it. It's a lot. I sweat. Yeah. I get a little jittery, but that's, yeah. I feel like. That means um, it's working. Yeah. I feel like hummingbirds do are real productive. You know? So yeah. why not? <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. So there back grew? there after I got out. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Um, what did you do when you were a kid? Um, got in a lot of trouble. I was a knucklehead definitely when I was growing up and um, played football, spent a lot of time outdoors. Uh, raised in a rural area, but mm. not on a farm, so hmm. that was kind of something post-military that I got into. So interesting. Yeah. I, before we go any further, it's KC Cattle Company, as in Kilo Charlie. Does that stand for Kansas City or Kansas stand for City. something else? Yep. Uh, okay. I was hoping it was some weird, cool yeah. old story. Can it's you make me. one? Up? Kevin Christopher. No, that's yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm. Su- I'm actually really surprised that wasn't taken. You know me too, because yeah. like when you're trying to decide on a name for a company, like the biggest thing is like, is the URL available? Right? Yeah. And I was like, there's no way this one's available. And sure enough, I bought it on GoDaddy for 99 cents. And that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Everyone that's else great. thought it was taken there. They were like, there's no there's way. There's no way. <laughs> yeah. So um, did you know you wanted to go in the military when you were a kid? Definitely. Probably about three years old. I yeah. mean, same story, action movies, Rambo, freaking Sylvester Stallone, yeah. like... From there on, it was like, that's what I wanted to do. I just wasn't sure what branch of the military. So, you know, most of my high school career, I thought I was going to go like the Navy SEAL route. And then, um, you know, I had a brother-in-law that was in first bat that kind of kept me from doing that. So good. Yep. He saved you. Yes. <laughs> good. Yeah. Um, did you go straight away after high school? Um, I had a ROTC scholarship. So mm-hmm. I did a year of that. And then I was like, I just can't do this officer side. Mm-hmm. So dropped out and enlisted after that. What, the, what school did you do that? Northwest Missouri State University. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's all. I, I don't know if you knew. I, I taught ROTC for my twilight tour in the army. Where'd you do that? At? Uh, St. John's University in New York. Okay. But man, that's such a, it's a wild system. Because, like, as you know, because like, you're like, what the fuck is this? But it's so like department or I mean, school to school and like year to year, it can change so much and give people a different perspective like the guy who I took over for when I went to him was like a complete piece of shit <laughs> so like be honest so a lot of people a lot you know He's everybody in that program was like you know they were like the army must fucking suck this guy's in charge of shit you know and then you have other dudes that are like really into their program and like really do a good job but then they leave and what's interesting about that world sorry this is kind of an ROTC tangent yeah. but <laughs> my boss his span of control was 46 schools. Holy shit. Right. And he had it. There's no, it's like not set up like a normal, like your span of control is three to five. It's no shit was 46. So my in brief, when I took the job was like, don't get fat and don't have sex with your cadets. I was like, eh, fucking high bar fucking <laughs> excellence there. I think I can do that. Yeah. I was like, eh, I think I'll be all right. Yeah. Anyway, well, tangent complete. And you're, you're spot on there because I wish I would have known like in high school, but I mean, you're dumb and you're like, oh, any school's going to be the same for, and we had like six schools that all fell into the same program. And so Northwest, and that's like Northern Missouri, right along the Iowa border there. And you'd travel down to uh, St. Joe, which is like just a terrible school, right? And that's, you do like your labs down there. Mm-hmm. And uh, PT was like 
dodgeball every morning. And yeah. I was like, how does this qualify <laughs> me to be an officer? You know, I yeah. was like, so uh, checks out. I was <laughs> like, you know, school's always going to be here. And if I decide to do this further down the route, I'll do that. But yeah, I mean, there were a number of cadets that I had that they would like, you know, come to me and ask advice. And I'd be like, you should fucking quit school and go on list. <laughs> yeah. I'm telling Sage you, like, advice, truly. you're, you're too good for this. <laughs> <laughs> don't be, don't become one of them. Yeah. It's too oh, man. So you did your ROTC. Here, we'll get that mic in your face. Yep. Um, so you did ROTC for a year, said fuck it, then straight away enlisted. Yeah, so uh, got a good recruiter story there. Yeah, I, had, uh, I had an MIP from my year in ROTC, right? And uh, What's an MIP? Minor in possession. I got caught. I blew like a .03 okay. when I was in college and got a minor in possession. And uh, so I did my security clearance interview for my 40 option. And... Uh, I got denied. And I, I remember I called Jeremy and I was like, man, like I got Wait, denied for an MIP. And what year is this? This is 2009. Hmm. Okay. And he's like, dude, there's dudes with like attempted murder charges in regiment, right? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and so I took like six month break and then I went to a different recruiter like two hours away from where I was at. And uh, he pulled my file and there's there like a security clearance document you had to fill out and I had never even seen it. And for like my refer references, I had like John Stamos and Bob Saget is like, <laughs> it was like the full crew of full house. It's like, and I was like, okay, so this, this explains it. So I ended up, uh, enlisting out of St. Louis and, um, that would have been 2010. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you guys can talk and talk about first bad things. Yeah. So you end up going, you know, doing that. What, what's it called then? It wasn't RIP anymore. RASP. Yeah. RASP. Yeah. So I was the second class to go through RASP. Yep. Okay. So you do yep. RASP. Well, basic airborne RASP. And then did you want to go to first bat? Yeah. First bat's where I wanted to go. Okay. Did you guys do the dream sheet that somehow never works? Yeah. <laughs> I, so I did that. And that's actually a funny story too, because um, Jeremy was about to rip out. Um, for a deployment there and Colleen was texting me. She's like, which one did you get? Which one did you get? Which who, who's my sister who's married to Jeremy? And, uh, I got put in second bat and like 45 minutes later, I had one of the RASP instructors come down and was like, what dickhead privates, uh, Montgomery get over here. Right. And I'm like, Oh God. And, uh, He's like, I just had, you know, the first bat commander call and, you know, he wants you in, in the first bat line. And I was like, oh, God. Um, and she was, friend, she was friends with his wife, right? So she texted her and I was like, oh, man, I'm really starting out on a good f foot here in first bat. So, yeah. That's funny. So uh, how far ahead was your brother-in-law? Uh, he enlisted in 05. Okay. So he'd been yeah. there for a minute. Yep. Gotcha. Um, so by then, what is he? Squad leader? Team yep. leader? He's just pin six. Yep. yep. Okay. Very cool. So you go to first bat. Please tell me that you got assigned to his squad. No, he tried. Yeah. He, he was already ripped out. Um, they'd left a couple months early. And he had tried. Um, but I ended up going to DECO, um, which is a company, not a company. I don't know where they're at right now. They're so. still a company, but they're now like the special troops company. They took all the like snipes and all that stuff out of HHC and Put them in made them DECO. Yeah. Hmm. So this DECO still exists. It's just Yeah. Now HHC isn't like 700 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so tell us, uh, tell us your story about first bet. Yeah. So uh, got to first bet. Um, would have been beginning of 11, and then we ripped out on deployment in April, and then uh, Jeremy got killed in June there, June 14th, and I ended up escorting his body home. Um, so I was brand new private doing that, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. Were so you were. In D were you down in Kandahar then? Yeah, or? yeah, I was down, yeah. In, down in Kandahar. He was up at, I think he was at a five shank when he actually got killed on that mission. So, yeah, it could have been. They 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 were the Darby, yep, platoon or Merrill or I don't remember which one we were calling it then. But yep, he Darby. was all over the place. They were all over the place. Yeah, but I think, I think they were running out of. OE then, Organ E. I, I think, think you're right. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Now that you say that, actually, yeah, yep. I think they were running out of Organ E. They had it. That, that platoon in particular had a really, really, really rough trip. Well, I mean, him and Patino were best friends, and then Patino got killed a month later, which was yeah. just bizarre. So. Yeah, yeah, that was, <clears throat> I took, right after, I was the TF Central Senior Enlisted Advisor, so, like, I was, you know, I went out on missions with them sometimes, like, up in OE, or I, when I would, like, travel around, but I was mostly out of Salerno. But then, when we came back, I took Bico, and 
yeah, that platoon, like, yeah, they got put through it, man. They're a lot, when saw you, a lot of shit. When did you get to Biko? Is that twelve? Uh, the deployment, or right when we got back from that deployment. That, that's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I did, I think, two deployments with one or two deployments with one seven five, and I was just a TFC when we deploy. You know, I was I was like the ops before, and then, yeah, that was. Those two, that deployment was kind of the last deployment of like the so-called glory days. Yep. When what year was that? Eleven, twelve ish. Yeah. In Kandahar. Area. Well, we were everywhere. Somewhere in RC East. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 But, what was that like being a private and having somebody so close to you pass away? Um, you know, I, like I was so excited to get to regiment and like seeing that. I think it kind of fucked me up. Like. Um, I saw behind the curtain probably like way too early in my military career of just like some of the stupid shit that goes on, um, like especially <clears throat> on the like the military almost politicking side. Mm -hmm. And so like they really fucked up the notification process. <clears throat> so I remember I had just come home from a, a mission and, you know, I'm a brand new private. So I'm in the ready room, like getting everything ready and prepped to go back out and uh, my squad leader gets pulled out by the first sergeant and CO, and then they come back in and ask for me, and, you know, I'm a brand-new private right in regiment. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> you know, about to get out. Yeah, exactly <laughs> what I do. Who was that at the time, Kurt Donaldson? Yep. Yeah. One of the best NCOs I've ever yeah. worked for. Amazing uh, guy. I hope he's listening. Yeah, exactly. We love you, Kurt. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, and so they came and pulled me out, and, uh, you know, our, our CO is, like, kind of beating around the bush. And I remember, you know, first sergeant Donaldson um, was just like, hey, man, I'm not going to— not gonna sugarcoat this. Your brother, your brother's dead, and uh, you're flying home with him tonight. And I was just like, "Fuck!" You, you, you like imagine like how that's all gonna play out in your head. And you know, I just went numb. Um, and the first thing that popped in my head was like, "My sister's not at home. She's in Kansas City visiting my parents." And so I told him, I was like, "You need to get a hold of uh, Jeremy's best friend because he got shot on the deployment before that, um, and he's home. You need to get a hold of him." And you know, have his wife kind of coordinate this deal. And what actually ended up happening was they told everybody back on rear D not to tell him. Oh, is that yeah. Ethan? No, uh, different guy? It, yeah. Was, oh, okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so they, they did that, and then uh, they ended up sending a notification team to my parents' house. Well, she was already gone. She was on her way to the airport. So then my parents think I'm dead, right? And it ended up they ended up notifying her in the Savannah airport. Oh um, fuck! And so it was it was a pretty messed up deal. Yeah. Um, and just I'm sitting here trying to help. At this point, I'm up in Bagram, and I'm like, you know, let me help with this deal. And they're like, well, you're a brand new private. I'm like, you're talking about my fucking family, mm -hmm. you know? And yeah. so private or not, you know, there, there's a point where you're just like, hey, you know, this is this isn't right. Let me get involved. Um, you know, I'd have this thing solved like that. So, yeah. And that didn't happen? It didn't happen. That's no. Up, yeah. No. Yeah. There's one NCO in particular who... Um, you want to roast them or what? You can roast them on here. No, I well, won't. I'll say, like, you know, when I left, 275 went to RHQ and then went to 175. Every first sergeant in that battalion when I was there was from a different battalion. Hmm. And it wasn't by accident. If that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. It's like there was a lot of, not from the people that were there then, but there was a lot of like empirical cultural bullshit mm -hmm. in that battalion that they yeah. were kind of trying to like push away. Yep. And that scenario is a per, is a, is a, is that culture personified? Yep. Like just, I hate the word professional or unprofessional, yeah. but they were fucking unprofessional. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was a very like, frat boy kind of fucking feel yeah. um, in that battalion. And, and well, it, it, did, it was like that for a long time. It did. Yeah, it yeah. was. And, and it just had to get cleaned out and it did eventually. But, uh, you know, because of great, great fucking dudes like Kurt Donaldson and, uh, you know, a few other guys, but no, I'm sorry that happened. I mean, and also, I mean, giving credit where it's due, that's a super unique scenario. It would, I, it would. but it could have been handled a little bit different. Yeah, it was crazy. I mean, and like looking back on it now, 11 years past when it actually happened. And I mean, it, 
if it wouldn't have happened exactly the way it did, I mean, I'm three weeks in the country on my first appointment, and I was able to to be there, right, and to bring him home. And, right. um, you know, it was the toughest thing I ever did. I handed my sister's husband back to her in a casket, right? And I'm four weeks past 21 years old, so I'm, I'm a freaking kid. Uh, yeah. That was a lot of growing up real quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I turned pretty dark there for quite a while after that. Did, did I, they end up— uh, pushing you back over or did you stay home i stayed home so yeah. they, they kept me home which i'm not sure if that was honestly the best thing yeah. that they could have done for me it's the best thing for my sister yeah mm-hmm. um because I, I ended up moving in with her out of the barracks and so i lived with her for you know the entire time i was down there first bet um but man like living with a widow at 21 years old and you know i did the best thing i could and trying to take their take shit she they had their firstborn son about four months before that deployment so he yeah. was six months old when jeremy got killed um, so, you know, I'm thankful I was there and I was able to take care of, uh, Everett and all that, but man, what a, what a wild experience. So this is a hard question, but I have to ask it. Um, at, at what point do you plan or did you tell Everett the story about his dad? You know, he's just now getting that age. Yeah. Um, I've got, I've got a 10 year old and a 13 year old and I'm, I'm thinking through like when would I want to know the the actual facts, um, and he hasn't asked about it yet, but I know it's coming. Yeah, um, he's starting to ask more questions, and it's kind of fun for me, right? Because his Colleen, my sister, and, and I, I only had sisters growing up, so Jeremy was the closest thing I had to an actual brother. They got married when I was a freshman in high school, and so um, it's fun for me now. Cause he starts to ask questions a little more like, hey, what was my dad like in this aspect? And yeah. you know, you can kind of tell him like the story that maybe his mom wouldn't want him to know, you know yeah. what I mean? So, <laughs> the good stuff. <laughs> the good stuff. That, this one time we yeah. had lighters and, uh, you know, aerosol. Anyways. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I will say, <clears throat> I remember cats. I wasn't in Bico yet, but you know, just being the ops and I, I yeah. you know, when you do platoon GVX or basically any externally evaluated exercise, you know, it was me, Bernie Foligno, um, Ray Fuller, uh, Donnie, all these guys, we were all OCing, you know, the platoon GVXs or basically anything that, and I knew I was taking Bico. So I would, I would always observe Bico because I wanted to, you know, get a leg up on, on knowing the company. And I remember finding out that cats had been killed. And I remember being like, fuck because he was fucking awesome like he was a super like he he reminded me like a little bit of like when i was coming because he was so young in the face like Mm. all the like hey does your mom know you're here like he was that guy like he looked like he was (laughs) indeed he just had like the biggest baby face he looked like he was 10 years old but then you would watch him on target like if you know if, if it was like at night you would you would just observe this squad leader like doing his shit and you're like god that kid's fucking awesome and then like you go to the AR and the lights come up and you're like, oh, what the fuck? You look like you're 10. <laughs> but like, man, baby, just he was, that perfectly. He was, you know, one of the best squad leaders I ever saw in, in the regiment as, as a senior leader, like observing. He was, he was always, it, it's, it's, uh, it sounds cliche, like I'm making it up, but it, it's true. He was always doing the right thing. Well, I mean, you know? he got killed, number one man, leading, leading his yeah. squad up to the target and first round from RPK, hit him right above the side sapper. It's like, yeah. I mean, he was a badass, so yeah, yeah. it's he always was, the best to get killed. Yeah, he was, a, he was a great ranger, great squad leader. So, And then Platino, the the first time, I, only time I met him was at Everett's baptism because Platino was the godfather, so that whole thing was just so biz- bizarre, man. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you're in a dark spot, you come home. Yep. Um, Living with your your sister who moved in with that, doing normal ranger shit. Are you back to work? Yeah, I'm back to work. Yeah. Uh, I went to ranger school November of eleven. No, excuse me. No, that's right. November of eleven. Yeah, I left for ranger school. Um, graduated ranger school April of twelve, and then I left mid rotator on that next appointment. Yep. Where'd you go? Uh, Fob Shank for that one. Okay. It was okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're kind of busy. It must have been pretty tough doing ranger school. Was that, you know, having the, the death just happen pretty uh, recently. Did that motivate you more? I you think, think so. Yeah. And, um, you know, I took Jeremy five tries to make it through ranger school. I mean, he, <laughs> he, uh, he got cellulitis once or oh, MRSA. Fine. He got MRSA once and then, 
I had a stress fracture in his shin another time, and then they tried to rig piers on another one, and his whole squad got recycled. So he had a hell of a time making it through. <laughs> yeah, he had a hell of a time making it through Ranger School. So I'm um, so glad that didn't happen to me because I would have quit. <laughs> you know, we've talked about this a bunch of times, but it's not the guy that makes it through. Because you always get a pat on the back, like, well, you made it straight through. But the guy that recycles, like, oh, God. Yeah, little did everyone know. know, if I'd been recycled, I would have quit. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Mountain's Phase, man. Mountain's Phase is like the one part where I was like, man, if I if I get peered or if something happens on this, like, I don't know if I can do this one again. You know? <laughs> oh, I was like, shit. You'll know. Yeah. What was that that thing in Mountain Phase we were trying to uh, then I, I found it out. Oh. Do you know what TVD stands for? Uh -oh. Oh, it's Tennessee Valley Divide. Oh. So the Tennessee Valley Divide ends right there in Dahlonega, which oh. is also the base of the Appalachian Trail. Oh. Yep. Learned something new. He was like, hey, man, you remember what this thing was called in in uh, uh, Mountain's Phase? I'm like, I have no fucking clue. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> either. And it was really actually hard to Google. Yeah. Because TVD, Tango Victor Delta, is also the acronym for a show about vampires called The Vampire Diary. So if you oh, Google yeah. TVD, oh. that's what pops That's all that comes up. So you had to make it to like page 10 of yeah, Google exactly. to actually figure out what it was. See, I always thought I was super cool doing OGA contracting because if you put in Reeves, it's... Christopher Reeves, Superman. You literally cannot find me. I did that yesterday. Yeah, did you? Yeah. I don't sure. I spent all. like 20 minutes trying to figure out who Dude, you were. My old man <laughs> bought uh, Truth Finder, yeah. like, because he's retired and doing stupid shit. And he's like, I looked you up, man. There's nothing on you. Nothing. <laughs> he thinks I'm like some, he thinks I'm Jason Bourne. I'm like, that's because of Christopher Reeves, Superman. Like, <laughs> but if you enter Maybe your like name into the search bar of Pornhub. <laughs> yeah. Do I pop up? What'd you say, Jen? Did you like just recently get social media though? Like, yes, you've I have been, two like, posts. In Don't... The chat, like lurking in the shadows. I was like, nervous that's about why it. There's nothing on Google. Yeah, I was. I was nervous about it. Yeah, you know, just doing the job that I had and having yeah. kids and facial recognition. I mean, tons of guys have it, and you just have to report it. Like, hey, I have these. Um, but yeah, one of my reinvestigations for my my TS, they were like, "Do you have this? Whatever it was, Facebook." I'm like, no. Do you have Instagram? I'm like, no. They're like. You're lying. <laughs> Where is it? I'm like, no, literally, I don't have it. I don't have, I don't have any social What's media. What's your alias? <laughs> I actually started it when I moved to Israel because it's very rare to not have anything. Yeah. So I needed some sort of outlet, and it was like a, more or less an approved way to be able to communicate. You know, if you had like some, not foreign contact, like you made a friend, instead of giving them your phone number oh, or an ops yeah. phone, I could just like DM back and forth. So it was pretty benign to start with, to be honest. Anywho, back on you. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I was like, I want to talk about steak. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get to the meat. Um, so you do, how many more trips did you have in first bed? How long did you stay? That, that was my last one. Okay. Uh, I moved over to Snot after that, and it, it was good. But like you I moved said, to what? Our sniper section. Okay. Yeah. Um, they didn't call it that when I was there. They, they didn't call it Snot when you were there? I don't remember that term. I went to Snipes before I left. Did you? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I did that for a little bit, and yeah, I, at that point, I just I was pretty screwed up, and um, I needed a break, so um, I ended up going to Fort Riley for the last nine months I was in, which was the worst thing I've ever done. What yeah. did you do there? Yeah. Huh? What did you do there? Um, I was just in an infantry squad. I stood up a oh. pre-ranger program for them. And, um, what year was this? 2014. 2014? Yeah. I've never no, been there. 2013, end of 2013. Was that like a passionate reassignment to Kansas? Or yeah. like... Yeah, it's, it's close. Yeah, yeah, Colleen was moving back home, and um, so I did that. I, I regretted that quite a bit, uh, but I did need a break from regiment. You and, probably had a big positive impact on everybody you were there with, though. I mean, like, it probably fucking sucked, but you it, probably changed a few people's trajectory. It was awesome. Like, it, I, and they do that more now, right, with regiment yeah. like, NCOs going out. So the impact you can have on those guys is huge because, I, I mean, like, what we would take is just extremely basic stuff, especially for like room clearing and things like that. I mean, it's just a yeah. foreign language to them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that, that, that was a lot of fun. Um, but at the same time, Fort Riley is an awful place to get stationed. So <laughs> it just seems very <laughs> flat and it, boring. It is very boring. There's nothing to hunt except for doves. Um, yeah. So it was, I was ready to get out. Did you say doves? Doves. Yeah. Are you saying dubs or flying doves? Yeah, they're really good to eat, actually. <laughs> yeah. if you, if you, but you got to shoot a limit to make a meal. So mm. I've hunted dubs. Flaming yawn in the school, in yeah. the sky. So. Did you grow up shooting? Uh, yeah, quite a bit. I didn't start hunting until I was about a freshman in high school. Okay. Um, nobody in my family did that. So I had a you know, high school buddy that kind of brought me into that world and freaking fell in love with it. So Yeah, awesome. Yeah. So you're at Fort Riley, finishing out the last nine months. Yeah. And then what happens when you're transitioning to, to 
civilian life? Um, well, I was thinking about going back and trying to do the long walk or something like that, uh, or just ETS. And, um, you know, funny story, you're my girlfriend before I joined the military broke up with me. The next day I went back to the recruiter's office and that's where I enlisted out of Columbia yeah. and we stayed in contact. And so we started dating again when I moved back to Fort Riley and she's my wife now. Um, but she was like, you know, what do you think about doing something in the civilian world? And we started throwing around ideas. Um, and one of them that she talked about was, uh, becoming a veterinarian. I was like, I can't handle working on poodles all day, but like the large animal side. <laughs> poodles are actually awesome. Poodles are really cool. They're very smart. Smart. But I just don't <laughs> like the way they look. I'll get more into like the small animal side, but like, um, so I worked it out with my chain of command. The last six months I was in, I worked at the vet clinic on post, which was super freaking cool because uh, they're working on all, like all the military working dogs. And then at Fort Riley, they have like the old uh, calf stables where they do like, you know, stuff around the country. So they work on all the equine and stuff there. So I got to do that the last six months I was in and I fell in love with it. Uh, so I went back to Mizzou, uh, to become a veterinarian. Uh, they have like a animal science program that I was doing. Um, but as I was doing like more research, I'm like shadowing at all different kinds of clinics and whatnot. Uh, one of the blessings of like going to school and you're older is you actually care. Mm -hmm. um, and it's way, <laughs> way, it's, it's way easier. You're not distracted by beer and women all the time. So, um, I just figured out, I mean, as a large animal vet, like out of vet school, where you pay like $120,000 for school, you're making like 45000 a year. I'm like... That's bad math. Yeah, I'm like, this just really <laughs> doesn't add up, right? And uh, Yeah, you got to go work for like an oil tycoon working on his like racehorses to make money. Yeah. Out of, you, right? you really do. And yeah. you have to specialize in like orthopedics or something like that for equine. And that's where the money's at. And I, I just really wasn't interested in doing another six years of school after eight, right? And so... Um, Ooh. Eight? What? Yeah, How so you do four years for your undergrad, four years for your DVM. Fuck, you and then if you doctor. go specialize in orthopedic or something like that, it's another three years, and then you have to do a residency after that. So much cool. Shit, even with the GI Bill, you're probably paying back a shitload of debt, too. Well, uh, Missouri has a super cool deal called the uh, Returning Heroes Act, mm -hmm. and so I didn't even touch my GI Bill until uh, I got done. Oh, yeah, it was, it was much later. Yeah, you're right, because um, I got into a couple schools, and actually, believe it or not, Princeton was giving out free rides to ex-vets. Really? I got into Princeton, and I got a housing allowance, a meal allowance. And because I had kiddo and wife and whatnot, I got like a three-bedroom apartment or some shit on or near campus and full ride. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a bunch like that. So for listeners, look at yellow ribbon programs and whatnot because there are tons of educational benefits that don't touch your GI Bill. Yeah, I think like that's definitely one disservice the military does for especially younger guys transitioning out is there's just no resources there. It's like, I figured all this out on my own. You got to dig. They don't, they don't want you it's to know because then you'll get out. Yeah. They don't want you to get yeah. out, the but it's like, now is, is I've, fucking terrible. I've, it's told so people, yeah. I've told people this a bunch or like, I'm like, it's by design. Yeah. It's not that they're bad at it. They're purposefully not telling you this shit because a, you're going to get out. If you know, like all these great things that you can go do B, all that shit costs money. Like, and if you're a, you know, a lobbyist and you're like, oh, I'm going to get this like veteran care thing put forward. And like, you look great for like getting the, the bill pass or whatever the <coughs> fuck you call it. Mm -hmm. But then if it doesn't cost you anything because no one knows about it, well, fuck, you win twice. Yeah. yeah they're like, oh, so we have this up. program. We'll I got this there, program like, pushed <laughs> through. <laughs> Only two people used it, but you what's know, whatever. The the, what's the name of the program they have you do? Ta is it TAPS? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Which is just, it's you just hit fast garbage. forward on the, on the, uh, <laughs> on the little videos they make you watch. Well, and then they like do the resume builder and all that. And I, I just remember some guy came in and, and they're like, nobody wants to hire vets because they think you all have PTSD and are going to shoot up the yeah. workplace. And I was like... Are you Fuck freaking kidding off. me? You know, like, um, and then when you get in the civilian world, you realize that companies love hiring vets. One, because there's a tax incentive, and two, because <laughs> they're on average normally quite a bit better employees than civilians. So they're just on time and follow directions. It's exactly. Just which yeah. is it's so hard to way, find. A way far better place yeah. than a majority of your civilian counterparts. Um, so, anyways, I'm doing my animal science program. Figure out you don't make any money as a large animal vet. So I got a job at a small animal clinic. And I did that for about a year and a half. And, uh, I mean, all you did all day was neuter, spays, and clean teeth. And I was like this. I just, I Wait, can't. wait, wait, wait. So are you, are you a veterinarian? No. No, oh, okay. Were you like yeah. a vet tech? In yeah, I was a theory? vet tech. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, um, it, was, it was an awesome job, an opportunity I probably wouldn't have got if I was just doing my undergrad. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I can't do this. So... 
my wife was like, you know, I agreed to be a sugar mama while you went to school, but you're supposed to <laughs> take over at some point here, right? And uh, so I started applying for jobs out of Kansas City. Um, got an interview at a really good company for like a security consulting position that was overseas. Um, and I'm sitting in the interview, the final interview, and one of their last questions was, uh, do you have any questions for me? And I was like, yeah, like, what do you spend the, I don't understand the job. Like, it's very like bizarre. Like, what, what do you guys actually do here? And he's like, well, if I'm being honest, like a majority of our day spent uh, convincing corporate or worth the money they pay us. <laughs> <laughs> I remember like the, the air just like fleeted out of my lungs. And I, I was like, th that interview was in Kansas City. I still lived in Columbia. So I had a two hour drive home and I called my wife and I was like, I can't fucking do this. Like I had this job that I loved where like you had this mission and purpose and you're doing all these awesome things. And then, um, you know, I'm selling out for a paycheck. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, I kind of chewed on it for a couple of days. And I remember I came home from class one day and I got a couple beers in me to have the liquid courage to tell my wife I was going to do this. And I was like, I'm going to start a company. And she's like, are you kidding me? Like you have no business experience. You didn't even get an A in economics. Um, <laughs> what are you thinking? And uh, so we threw around ideas for quite a while there. Uh, and, you know, kind of not being from ag background and going to animal science, which was super ag, ag heavy. Uh, if you're doing that program, you're either going to vet school or you're an ag person that's trying to get hired by a nutrition company or an animal pharmaceutical right. company or something like that. And one of the things I noticed while I was there is just this huge disconnect between the people that produce the food in this country and the people that actually consume the food in this country. Yes. And they just have no idea, right? They like look at this label and they're like, oh, cage free. That's like awesome, right? And they don't understand the rules on how you get to say oh, cage free or exactly. free range. Like, yeah. oh, your chicken walked around for 30 minutes today. <laughs> and then we put it back in the thing with all the other chickens that are fucking each other up. But it's a uh, free range. They have access to 138 square feet. They don't actually use 138 square feet of pasture, right? <laughs> is so, is that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty I mean, and so I saw an opportunity there. Um, I had a, another ranger buddy we actually met. He was friends with Jeremy, um, who owns Ranger Cattle down in uh, um, Austin, Texas. And he was doing Wagyu beef uh, on the restaurant side. And, he, and so I did an internship my last year down there with him, and I just fell in love with it. And so uh, kind of my model was going to be a little bit in the restaurants, but really kind of focus on serving the direct consumer model. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what I did when I graduated. Fun, Interesting. Fun side tangent here. You know that Kurt Donaldson just retired, right? Oh, he reached and, out. And he's doing cattle in <laughs> Pennsylvania. So huh. such a fun little thing. But yeah. anyway, yeah, it's awesome. But what, <clears throat> what specifically made you think like cattle and not like chickens or pigs or, or, or whatever? Or do you do all that? Well, we, we sell all that, but yeah. we only we only raise cattle. I'd, I worked at all those farms. I yeah. worked at a swine facility. I, I did a little bit with, like, chicken houses and stuff like that. Man, it's just gross, man. Yeah, it is gross. Yeah, okay. Pigs, Pigs yeah. are gross. Chicken I, uh, are disgusting. Cattle are— In high school, I lived about three-quarters of a mile from a chicken farm. Holy <sighs> fuck, does that stink. It smells so bad. Yeah. And so, pigs are as bad, too, because it's ammonia. I mean, it just reeks yeah. of ammonia. That's nasty. Uh, I had a rental about a year ago. And big ass field, but it was a loading lot. So they'd bring the cattle in and then they'd sit and then they'd, you know, load them into different trucks to go to different places. You could tell when that was going on. Oh, yeah. It fucking permeated, especially in the Northwest because there's so much humidity. It would just sit yeah. in your fucking Stack house. <laughs> gnarly, I'd, I'd love to know though, like we, we touched on it briefly, like, and she is a psychopath about my food her food <laughs> and like i try to do, i do my best mm -hmm. right but you don't know what you don't know so like i don't fuck i don't know what the fuck cage free and free range and fucking org i don't even know what organic means i also want to know what those are yeah, yeah. so yeah can you educate us yeah uh the organic's a, a tough one for me so we're not certified organic and the reason for that is because you can't use any antibiotics on your on your property right and uh, a lot of your big feed lots put antibiotic in in the actual feed because uh, it helps the animals gain weight faster we don't do that but if we have a sick and dying animal i'm not going to sit there and watch it die right so it, just like if it was one of your yeah. kids that has a an ear infection you're gonna go give it antibiotics so we do do that and so we can't be certified organic for that reason that is wild yeah yeah so um if you're eating organic the organic label is pretty legit 
Mm-hmm. But if you're actually raising the animals and you care about the animals, it's really tough to, to kind of go by that, right? <laughs> so it's like survival of fucking fittest if you're a cow on an organic farm. Like, that's it. Uh, and that's part of the reason it's so expensive because, yeah. I mean, the animal loss is way higher for, for properties. No shit. That. That's yeah. If they get sick, you just slaughter them and you can't use that meat because the animal's sick, so it's a waste. So yep. like, well, and a lot of times it's yeah. calves, so I, and unless you have a veal program, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, that you, makes uh, perfect sense. Yeah, so veal, veal is good. It's so good, but it just breaks my heart. <laughs> yeah, veal is good. There's no Wagyu veal, though, because it wouldn't be marbled out yet. But, um, yeah, so the labeling thing's crazy. Um, you got to be really careful. Uh, if you're looking for good chicken, one of the ones that we serve, it's also a veteran-owned company, is Pasture Bird. And they actually got half their company bought out by Purdue, which some people are like, eh, but uh, they still do things like legit. chicken is like peasant food. There's not enough nutrients in I it fucking love me. chicken. Yeah. Do you really? <laughs> yeah. Did you say peasant food? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just not as enough nutrients in the bird as there. And then, like... It, being close to a chicken farm, you've smelt it. I'm from the south. Like I mean, I've my shit smelled stinks. Chicken I still touch farm. myself. Like, I don't want a part of that. Have you like, seen it? Tastes like whatever you put on it too. Yeah. Like, have you seen so the video? So does tofu. Yeah. Garbage. Have you seen the videos where they like of a chicken that they've pumped full of steroids so they can grow it as big as possible? Yeah, it, it all has, freaks me out. Yeah, the I feathers like fall out. It's got no energy. It basically like so, I eats eat and that naps. Shit. So that I don't want to eat a sad <laughs> animal because then it's going to in return make me sad. I'm very. I want to eat an animal that led a healthy life. Like. I'm not like I am crazy about what I eat. I always been my my family had a dairy farm in Wisconsin. My grandpa grew all his own food. So my dad is like this like hippie like so he instilled that in us at a very young age until I went off to the army and then I was like I can eat breakfast at the gas station. So like I've gone through like evolutions yeah. of it for sure. And I went vegetarian before I went carnivore. I'm more animal based. Okay, now. we can still and be you, friends because yeah. you did carnivore after <laughs> vegetarian. <laughs> what? And, and you do unpasteurized milk and you. You were raised on a dairy farm. No, I drink raw milk. Raw milk. Yeah. Man, I can't believe that. Yeah. I drink it too. Is that bad? Uh, have you ever been uh, like? Okay. You, it's, are, okay. She's about to it's, <laughs> it's fucking delicious. Okay. It is delicious. Yeah. It it is can it, be very disgusting. It's gross. It can be very disgusting. Yeah. It can. Um, I don't want to ruin it. There might be like a little people. bit of poop in your milk. Yeah. yeah. Oh, or a little care. bit of yeah. pus. A little bit of pus. A little yeah. bit of poop. Oh, I don't care about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so <laughs> it's like, but it's not pasteurized. So there's more protein than I. Oh. Um, <laughs> so it's good for you. It is true. Yeah. <laughs> Another kind of like one of the questions I was looking forward to asking you was uh, I fucking love steak. I think everybody here does. Yeah. Yes. And I eat, I probably eat red meat six days a week. Yep. Same. So. When you say, and this is a question that I'm embarrassed to ask, <laughs> but everybody else probably doesn't know the fucking answer. What does Wagyu mean versus like, if I go to a steakhouse and there's like a cowboy ribeye and a Wagyu fucking tomahawk and like all these things, what does Wagyu actually mean? Because so that's, that's, that's what's special. I've never been on a podcast and not been asked that question. So <laughs> okay. um, Wagyu means black cow in Japanese. Okay. Akiyushi, if you've heard of that one, just means red cow in Japanese. Um, it is a breed of cattle. So basically how the story goes is we, us and the Europeans brought cattle to Japan back in like the 1400s or something crazy like that, 1600s, I think, actually. And they used them as draft animals to plow up like rice paddy fields. And uh, the animals just kept killing over because they were 18 hours a day doing this, right? And cows just can't handle that. When what they figured out was there's this like one lineage of cattle uh, mostly like Angus, kind of some other like no purebred stuff like what we have now. They wouldn't fall over dead. They could work all day and they're fine. And the reason for that is because they had two mutations. They were depositing a ton of intramuscular fat in all of their muscles. So they had all this extra energy that they could use throughout the day. The byproduct of that was like the best steak anybody's ever tasted. Mm-hmm. And so they bred on that lineage for you know 400 plus years. And then it came over to America I've heard two stories about this, and I have no idea which one's true. One story is uh, the Japanese gifted, like, 20 heifers to um, some senator at, like, Washington State or something like that. Mm. And he was supposed to kill them and use the meat, and he's like, fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is, like, an extremely valuable uh, breed of cattle. And so that, you know, the whole herd in America originated from less than 100 animals. Because I, I feel like, and maybe it's just because I'm, like, getting older and I'm, like, more bougie about the things I eat, but <clears throat> I feel like— Ten years ago, you didn't really see Wagyu on menus like you do now. Yep. It's become like a thing. Well, there's fucking Wagyu uh, jerky now. 
I saw it for the. I bought it for the first time the other day. We're, about, yeah. to, we're about to start selling Wagyu jerky. Fuck yeah, man! Send yeah. something my way. We will. We'll send. We'll send you guys out a care exactly. package. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm actually curious. How do you start a cattle business? You just get a calf and you're like, here we go. Yeah, that's. I mean, because uh, the gestation of the animal and like, talk me through that. Yeah. So, um, my final semester of school, I like put together this business plan. I'm trying to get funding. Uh, I applied for like a bunch of grants. There's a ton of USDA grants out there and you get a bunch of, a bunch of preference points if you're a veteran. So if anybody's out there, we get asked all the time, veterans love ag and trying to get into it. So we try to help guys out all the time with this, but, um, we didn't get any of them because I didn't realize that like, I should probably go network with all these people like senators and things like that, that make the decisions for these grants. Hmm. Um, but you know, I essentially bought my first cow with my wife and I's savings and she had explicitly told me not to buy anything when I went to this auction because we lived in suburbia <laughs> in Columbia, Missouri, right? And she's like, where are you? So I called her. We're like, putting a cow in the backyard. Yeah, exactly. Next to the gonna live in the spare bedroom. Yeah, <laughs> we're on a quarter acre lot. And I was like, <laughs> so anyways, I, I bought a fir- our first heifer in the fall of 2016. And I mean, it was really kind of more so just telling the story, right? So guerrilla marketing, built our social media. We started talking about like, here's what we're doing. Here's, and um, it kind of grew from there. So we were buying a lot of fats and trying to find like a ranching partner to work with on this. Cause um, you know, my original business plan was like, I want to own the whole thing, right? Like from calf, uh, from mom to calf, to finish, to processing, to selling the meat. And it's probably a good thing I didn't know anything about business and that I was pretty naive because, uh, yeah, it did not work out that way. And I would have needed like millions of dollars to make that happen. Right. Um, but we, I mean, we bootstrapped it, right? So we had a $50,000 seed investment that we built the company on. Um, <clears throat> and I remember like watching Black Rifle and Evan Hafer and Matt Best. That, that was like all happening. You know, they were really blowing up like right as I was starting the company. And I was, I mean, that was huge motivation for me, like watching those guys. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. All right. So you did, in fact, start with one cow. I started with one cow. Yeah. Sure, and like grassroots effort. American yeah. American dream. Yeah. Yeah. And then do you just, you process it, take it to like a farmer's market or? So we started then, out doing like farmer's markets. Um, we really started out pretty heavy in the restaurant market in Kansas City, okay. but there was two problems with that. You mentioned like um, 10 years ago, nobody knew what the hell Wagyu beef was. Yeah. Uh, we battled that constantly everybody's like why are you trying to sell me a 60 dollars strip steak right like this is the midwest yeah. and uh it's crazy like i was probably about a year early but at the same time i was probably like just about perfect timing yeah um because within a year that question just went away people stopped asking me <laughs> why are you charging this this amount of money for a strip steak um so we started out in the restaurant business that was okay uh it's really tough to build a company on the restaurant market because um that's a tough business in itself with super tight margins and they stretch you on paying bills and everything else. And as a, you know, a startup, it was really, really difficult to like scale that. Mm -hmm. So, um, we did that for about a year and then I had to, you know, kind of sit down with some of the people that were advising me and it's like, this isn't working. And so we pivoted and really started to focus on the, the mail order side. And, uh, we got some pretty awesome press, like Today Show, uh, Fox News, Forbes, New York Times, um, within that first year. But it was always like this upward spike of sales and then nothing yeah. sustainable, right? And uh, we kept going like that. And um, it was a random Thursday, August 1st, 2019. And I'm like over at a neighbor's farm who has pigs and I'm helping them put up some fence. And, you know, I use we use Shopify for our e-commerce. So at that point, you know, I got notifications every time we got an order. And at this point we're shipping maybe 30 orders a week and my phone starts blowing up with orders. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I jump in my truck and it's about a five minute drive back to our ranch. And then in that time period, we had about a thousand, 1500 orders roll in. Fuck. And so I called the PR firm that we're using for this stuff. And I'm like, did something hit today? that like, I don't know about. And she's like, I don't think so. And, uh, Thank God there was like nothing to talk about except how terrible Trump was on August 1st, 2019, because there there was like an article about um, uh, our hot dogs proclaiming their best in the world. And they were hands down our worst seller when we launched them. Right. And uh, so we had 12,000 orders roll in, about a million people visit the website. And it was a food and wine article that basically was like, this is the best hot dog I've ever tasted in my no life. Shit. And so it was no like, shit. Number one article on Apple News for about 24 hours, and that was what really kind of put us on the map. Could you meet the demand? (laughs) (laughs) 
we allowed back orders at that point, right? Yeah. And so we had maybe 30 packs of hot dogs in stock. When, <laughs> <laughs> and so we had... Wagyu hot dogs are good. They're delicious. Yeah. And we'll We're turning you into a hot dog. You into a hot dog. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm calling my buddy in you know, Austin and I'm calling like all these people that we've worked with in the past. I'm like, you have beef that I can buy from you? Like, cause, and I sent out an email. It, it's funny because like when I first got home, I was like, we got to turn off the website. Like, this isn't be like, this isn't to kill the company. Like, mm-hmm. death by growth is a very real thing. Thing. Yep. And my wife's like, you're not freaking touching that button. <laughs> you're going to let this thing roll. You're going to make fucking hot dogs. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so how many hot dogs do you get from a cow? Yeah. Yeah. How many? Wait, well, I got to know. Yeah. But you don't like say in that scenario. Yeah. Are you going to like sacrifice the ribeyes and all that shit for the hot dogs? No. You're going to still. Okay. Yeah. People ordered everything else too. So we were like in the whole like 5,000 ribeyes and 5,000 strip steaks. Shit. And yeah. How many? How many ribeyes do you get out of your average cow? About 25. No shit. Yeah. How many hot dogs? Is it? Uh, you get about 400 pounds of trim that you can turn into hot dogs, ground beef, summer sausage, whatever. So, nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, we do have Lord Hot Dog. Who want to know that? Yep. JT. <laughs> Are there ever, and you may not know this, I'm just wondering, because when I go to like, say I go to a super bougie restaurant and they have like a burger that's like crazy, it's like way good. Is that always going to be trim, or do they ever just, like, grind a fucking ribeye and make a burger? Steak burgers. Um, oh, yeah. It's pretty rare that they'll throw, like, your top three ribeye strips, filet mignon in there. Um, yeah. But they might throw, like, some sirloin. Yeah. Or, like, uh, your chuck, anything from the chuck in there. I don't I don't know if I've ever—I know I've told Jenna this story because we always eat the steak here, but— I didn't know steak was good. And if my mom listens to this, I've told her this before. I didn't know steak was good until I was a grown adult in the army because we would buy sirloin and my mom would cook it. Well done. Well done. Yikes. And I remember, you remember in basic training, you get like a pass, like your fucking first leg. It's like at week 10, you get to go for like 36 hours. You and your buddies go and fucking nine dudes share a hotel room and like go and eat yeah, at Applebee's watching. or whatever. And <laughs> fucking all my buddies were like, yeah, we're going to go get a steak. And I was like, all right, that's fucking weird. <laughs> why, don't we go get like, why don't we go get something good? So we get, went to like Texas Roadhouse or fucking Longhorn or some shit in fucking Fort Benning, yep. you know, or Columbus. And the server's like, she's like, how do you want your steak done? I was like, oh, I don't know. Like I've never fucking ordered a steak in <laughs> a restaurant. Options. And I was like, just give me what they got. And then I like took a bite and I was like, holy fuck, this is delicious. <laughs> Blew your mind. Literally, yeah. literally the exact same story. My parents were well done people and they always did top sirloin or th- something of that yeah. nature. And I was like, steak is disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> like, how much I want sauce candidate. can we put on it? <laughs> well, yeah. They, everybody always tells us we need to get steak in Pat Mahomes' hands. And I'm like, well, uh, Patrick Mahomes, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, we well, puts A1 on steak. So I'm not sure if that's good branding yeah, or not. That's, yeah. that's not good marketing. Yeah. Um, so how'd you keep up with that big ass order? Um, you know, honestly, we were just honest with folks and, yeah. you know, people are like, how did, like, how did your customers not revolt and kill you? And we just sent out an email. We're like, Hey, like we're one and a half people that work at this company. And if you want your hot dogs, it's going to take me eight to 12 weeks to ship them. And we maybe had 8% of people that asked for refunds and we did that and everybody else was, I mean, I say that we definitely had our share of customer service issues, but, uh, we just got to work and I hired a bunch of people and we got orders out the door and then we rolled straight into the pandemic. So how'd that work? We were slammed. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were slammed because people in New York and California and places like that can find protein on their grocery store shelves because yeah. the big four, I mean, you got four companies in this country, country that control 80% of the protein. Um, so That's a pretty it, staggering Oh, it's, 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 it's unreal. Scary. And yeah. so when they, when they shut down their processors, it, it just puts such a strain on the rest of the market because um, we were just coming out of... This crazy hot dog deal. So we were shopping for a bigger processor. <laughs> crazy hot dog. And we call it the hot dog extravaganza, right? So, <laughs> How um, big is your, your, your facility, your farm at that time? And then what did you have to scale to to get through the, the, the hot dog part? <laughs> um, 
we we're still in the same place. We have a basically it's a barn, right? It's a shed. It's about six thousand square feet, um, about two thousand square feet of that's climate controlled. Uh, we do all our pick and pack in there, and then we have about a three hundred square foot walk in freezer, um, and then we have offsite storage, okay. cold storage. Um, we bought property to build a huge expansion, and then the world lost its mind with inflation, and so that's kind of on hold for the time being. So gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So you already scaled up a little bit. Then the pandemic hits. You're getting orders because be out of necessity. <laughs> It was crazy. Well, also during the pandemic, I know I become a fu- became a fucking meat master. Oh, yeah. Like that was what I did. It's like because you know, like, you're stuck at home. Smoked meats or made bread. Yeah. And that was. Yeah. Like- <laughs> I figured out how to fucking cook the fuck out of some meat. And, and everybody else. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was crazy. Like we we would put in you know twenty beef worth of inventory and we'd sell out in fifteen minutes. And it was like, well, I don't have anything else coming in the door for another thirty days, yeah. right? So that was the frustrating part. Is um, we finally got lined up with like a, a bigger processor and three days before our appointment, uh, they burned down. <laughs> and so I was like, okay. Um, so, I mean, it's a huge, huge problem in this country is processing. And I think it was identified in 2020. And now a lot of investors have seen that. And I mean, we've seen just in our area, 10 new ones come online. The, so The fragility of our like supply chain and food is like fucking scary. It's right? very scary. And, I've talked about this before about how how it's also making Americans pretty unhealthy. Like I went when I retired, I went to Europe for like 10 weeks and fucking backpacked around, probably went to the gym four times, just ate and drank like a fucking pig (laughs) and walked around and I came home and I'd lost weight. Yep. And like that made me just like, holy shit, our food is just not fucking good. And then I dug into it a little bit about how the way it's distributed, like we have to put all this bullshit in it. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Europe, there's, I mean. The chain of custody is much shorter. It's much shorter. I mean, yeah. they've also been doing it for fucking thousands of years longer than us or hundreds of years longer than us. We're still pretty young. But what do you, th- I mean, if you have an opinion, like what do you think we should be doing to like rein that in? Aside from buying from places like yourself. Well, on one side, I think there's things you just shouldn't be allowed to put in food. I mean, that's one thing that you does way better than we do is like you can't use high fructose corn, corn syrup, yeah. which is like, I mean, one of the yeah, worst things one, you can put yeah. in your body. Well, that was the that was the whole food pyramid and corn industry subsidizing, you know, way back in the day that pushed it into fucking everything. Everything. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, I, I think that's one thing that's frustrating is like our government just doesn't care or they're, you know, there's things going on that... Um, behind closed doors that we just don't know about or this stuff's still being allowed. But on the on the meat side of the business, um, there's a happy medium there because we're also the only species that's maintained an exponential growth pattern like we have for as long as we have. Um, and so to feed that population, it's like we have to get more efficient. And so some of the things we hate as consumers and that I agree with that are probably not good for you, it's like, well, we kind of have to do this to feed the world, right? And so yeah. there's kind of a... a almost a dichotomy there of like what's the right answer yeah like there's a a demonization of the word gmo right like a lot of shit is gmo be out of necessity or else our food will fucking rot yeah you know before it gets to people i think it's all about education how do you feel about regenerative farming um i mean there's a i think we we have to do more of it yeah um we definitely have to do more of it and we need people to care uh, less about profits, especially on the the big eggs. Yeah, I mean, how you do that though? That's, it's just human that's, nature, yeah, right? And I don't think we'll—I don't know if we'll ever beat that. And it's just funny, like you know, people get so bent out of shape about environmental stuff with like cattle and everything else, and it's like, well, we don't really have like a—it's not the cattle's fault, right? It's, we have a population problem yeah. uh, where we're consuming the world's resources. <laughs> um, yeah, really just a lot of people about. farting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A lot, a lot of farts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's about education. Like people pick up a label and they don't even understand what the fuck is in the food, you know, even aside from, you know, meat or beef or whatever. I feel like the information that's being disseminated is incorrect also and mm-hmm. also oversaturated. Like you can look at, you can try to find one article that's going to say that like coffee is, is very good for you and then another that's, it's terrible. Same with meat, same yeah. with anything. 
well, yeah. anything. Even yeah. like the CDC's new guidelines for like the type of oils you should be consuming. It's like soybean oil and disgusting. And then yeah. you're, you're, nope. you're, it's like no. I'm going a whole tangent. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, it's, like, I mean, it's like you. We gotta we gotta stop this stuff. So I don't know what the right answer is because it's like I mean we do still have an exponential growth pattern for the human population and we got to feed those people or you know that 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 curve has to subside at some we point. We need a purge. Yeah, we do. <laughs> actually, and, and I'll be the dickhead. farming and the purge. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, this is going to sound, I'll probably get hate for this, but when COVID kicked off and they said like, hey, it's going to thin the population, all this shit, I'm like, well, it's been a hundred years. Like that's kind of how we have to, to survive because we can't sustain the, the population growth that we have going on. And food chain is like kind of the biggest thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's like, if we get rid of cattle it's like where are people going to get red meat from i mean that is a necessity for you to be a healthy human being yeah. is is to have a, a healthy iron level so it's like if you're not getting it from red meat where are you getting it from because that I is the most you bugs grasshoppers yeah there's a whole bunch of grasshoppers for it. it's crazy the, the eu right there's a huge mm -hmm. push because like people can't afford beef Correct. right now yeah, yeah. Actually, I was lucky when I lived in Colorado, and I've always been pretty mindful of diet, but then you start to dig more. Like, okay, well, I'm eating this. What's actually in that? Yep. You know, like trying to eliminate all the bullshit that you're putting in your body. And there was a um, sustainable farm right around the corner where they did, you know, they'd move the herd mm -hmm. around and whatnot. They supplied a specific restaurant, but one of my jujitsu buddies was working there to mm -hmm. learn. Uh, his name's Adam. I got to go to the farm and hang out. I actually taught him to shoot, so I would get some meat. He'd give me meat. I'm like, yeah. you don't have to do that. He's like, no, no, no. I get like this allotment. But it was cool because you look at it and the chickens are much smaller. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like everything's kind of smaller, but it's also reasonable. And I always think about apples. Like back in the day when you walked around, like, you know, caveman me went, huh, that apple's this big. And now we've just pumped it full of fucking everything. So it's this giant. You know. Ch chicken's the one you can tell the biggest difference on because yeah. it is one thing we don't talk about like we talk we always talk about like the inputs into the animals but we never talk about the genetics itself like we have really jacked up the genetics on like I, it was always um yield instead of taste and quality and things like yeah. that so like oh it's so fucking delicious oh when we were and trying to small man and and like you're like wait chicken actually tastes like something yeah you know and, so and after you eat that chicken you feel satiated right yes. like <clears throat> one of my buddies who's a uh, Aussie dude, but he's been living in South America for a while. He's like, when I come to the States and I eat a steak, like at a restaurant, I'm still hungry after I finish yeah. it mm -hmm. because like the I'm used to getting like nutrients from my food and I just don't get it here the same way. Yeah, Everything. He gave me like yeah. some pork chops, chicken, you know, the cuts of meat tasted way better. So now I'm, now I'm becoming bougie and I'm like trying to buy better things. How much does Wagyu cost right now, pal? So we've raised prices about 45% in the last mm -hmm. year. Okay. Um, so last year was supply chain issues. So mm -hmm. we got price, I mean, I'm sure you guys did too. We got price increases on everything, cardboard, uh, gel packs, dry ice, labor. Um, and then this year, the ag side just lost its mind with the war in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, fertilizers up 12x what it was a year ago. Oh, shit. Um, corn and beans are up almost triple what they were pre-pandemic. Um, and then obviously fuel, which are... I mean, those are your main inputs. And then you throw a drought in some of our biggest cattle producing states in the country on top of that. Um, and we got some serious issues. So it's going to keep going up for some amount of time. Uh, specifics like a, um, a pound of ribeye right now for Wagyu for like our classified, which is like our... Um, we go off our BMS score, so that's BMS four to seven, which is what what's the, BMS mean? Um, body. I knew you were going to ask me that. <laughs> body mass. Yeah, it's, a, it's the intramuscular fat, um, gotcha. and so basically the Japanese use this grading scale like one to twelve. In the states, we have you know select choice prime essentially. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little more advanced, so we use that. So like our classified is four to seven, and that goes for about sixty one fifty a pound right now. Wow. Yeah. Fucking worth it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. That was my thing, actually, uh, living in Israel. There was one butcher that did, like, normal butcher, like you would, instead of, you know, the whole Jewish thing. And I would get a Wagyu steak, and it was about 100 bucks a pound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, like, people, some some people hear that if you're not familiar with Wagyu, and they're like, that's crazy expensive. And then people that are familiar with Wagyu are like, that's actually still a pretty good price. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's one of the fortunate parts. We're one of the few that, like, does... The entire animal on the, on the hoof, right? So we're not buying what's called box meat, box meat, where you're like buying strips, ribeyes, and flamingon, the things that sell. We're buying the entire animal. Nice. So, 
Very yeah. cool. Yeah. And then the rest becomes hot dogs, right? Yeah. yeah. We, we sell a huge variety. I mean, so that, that's kind of our other claim to fame is we sell a ton of unique cuts that you probably can't find in most of them. Yeah, places. I checked out your website last night, and I was like, I got, like, analysis paralysis about what I wanted because there's just, like, so much shit. I was like, I want all of it. And then I was like, uh, my cart's fucking $3,900. <laughs> <laughs> no you, so, you, I mean, obviously, you're still doing e-com, right? Is yeah. mailing it out. Are you on a subscription page thing also? So we just launched, a, did, like, a soft launch on a subscription this spring, and we'll probably start marketing that a little more next year. Yeah. Um, we've lost a ton of consumers this year just with those price increases. Mm-hmm. Um and the wholesale market is kind of, we're, we're going back into that. So we're in like 40, excuse me, 25 grocery stores in Kansas City right now and oh, about cool. 10 restaurants. Um, but we're trying to go after some of the bigger dogs for our further process items. Yeah, fuck yeah. Uh, yeah. So. All right, man. Thanks for coming out. Thanks yeah. for chatting. I think that's a good stopping point. So where can people find you? Yeah. So if you uh, get on any of the social medias, we're uh, at Casey Cattle Company. And then uh, our website's CaseyCattleCompany.com. I love an entrepreneurial story from a veteran. And thank you for sharing your story, man. It yeah. means a lot to me. Yeah. Thanks for having thanks, me. On. Thanks for uh, being so open. Yeah. A lot of that stuff. Yeah. Really yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. That concludes today's training. Any questions? Jump titties, boy!